This is a great show because it's two amazing comedy writers and they both come from opposite ends of the spectrum. I'm going to give these guys a proper introduction. To my left, or radio right, is, radio right. is Andy Breckman. And I wanted to put him on with Steve Young because they are two very amazing men, two great comedy writers, both of whom are legends, both of whom work for Letterman. Let me introduce Legend, Breckman. Legends is a funny word. That's an elastic word. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Breckman created Monk, the hit no, television okay. show. He just won a Writers Guild Award. He has written on Saturday Night Live. He has written for Letterman. He was there at the beginning. And he's written movies starring Meg Ryan and Walter Matthau. You are an actual movie writer. And I've been, I've been very lucky. Yeah. Well, yeah, some you've movies, some movies, yeah. Movies with Steve Martin, and you've written on the Academy Awards. I'm just going to keep going till I've had I've Steve... had some movies made that I wish weren't made. Yeah, that's true, too. Steve Young, you weren't there at the beginning. Oh, no, I was just a tiny boy when the Letterman show was launching. Steve Young, Harvard Lampoon. Didn't even go to Harvard. That's how amazing he is. That They just put him on the... They just put him on, on the magazine. Simpsons, long, I think you were, I'm going to say, without you, and you'll say no, but I would say, well, that's not fair to certain people. I would say you, uh, David Letterman, if you think David Letterman is funny, which we all do, then Steve Young is funnier. I would, I would assume that if you ask David Letterman, Who's funnier, you or Steve Young? He would say Steve Young. Well, because you would have painted him into a corner. And that would be <laughs> yeah. the only gracious <laughs> thing for him to say. And I, I, I think we must realistically say that Mr. Letterman has uh, realms and reaches that uh, yes. very few mortals have, and I'm not one of them. And he's, and he's certainly, if, if such a thing is possible, he's actually gotten more interesting. David Letterman. He is finding a way to his next chapter, and it's even more fascinating. Both of you men teach comedy at NYU. In fact, our paths literally crossed uh, last week. Steve's. One of the relatively few times when it's okay to say literally. Yes, yeah, it that's actually true. Happened. It actually happened. <laughs> Steve was uh, Steve's class had just ended, and mine was just about to start, and we, we met briefly in the lobby. Hey, you're that guy. Yeah, you're that guy. Yeah. There we go. Well, did you go to the dinners? I know Letterman had these big dinners during the wrap-up to the, <coughs> the show. D didn't you guys meet at a steakhouse? Were you at the Friars Club thing? I was at the Friars Club thing, and then I think David's referring to uh, a, a dinner. Steve was not there. It was a dinner that we arranged for uh, the original writers uh, and, uh, and Mr. Letterman. Yeah, met, they they uh, didn't want me because I was only a tiny boy at the time. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we all... Uh, I, I don't know if Steve had a chance. It's very interesting. I, I, I was glad I went to that, that dinner, <clears throat> that smaller private um, dinner with Letterman because I wanted to say thanks, really. <clears throat> Letterman, uh, you had you had The Simpsons and you had a, a pedigree that I, I didn't have, but <clears throat> Meryl Marco and Letterman gave me my first job in the business, my first break, and you always remember the people that what happened? That took you. We just, we uh, just took had, a chance on you. We just had Meryl Marco on you did the show. Hear? Yes, she was on, and I would listen to it because, again, if you're funny, you're. She is funnier now than she's ever been <coughs> in her life. Well, I owe her. Uh, I thought she obviously predated Steve. I think at the show, but I you owe dated her, Meryl. I no, predated. I'm sorry, oh. uh, but I owe That's her. That's a good rumor to start, though. Let's <laughs> try it. I owe her uh, my career. I owe her everything. What she, happened? She, I was, uh, it's not a great story, but if that's, if you want that's to what lay it on us, yes. <laughs> that's what the show, I'll, I'll, even if I, even if I consciously stop and embellish it just, to, to, to the nth degree, right. it won't be a great story. Well, okay, but right, I, was, uh, it's, it's, I was, I was, I was. Just use the word sex dungeon and we'll be fine. I was, uh, I was performing. I, uh, I was doing some uh, performing, got an agent. This is. Uh, and I applied to Saturday Night Live. I wrote some sketches. Saturday Night Live was turning over after the glory years, after the first five, uh, first five years. Lorne Michaels left. I'm sure you you're aware. And 
all the cool kids left the show, and so there were some slots open in Saturday Night Live. And I apply, I wrote some sketches, four or five sketches, and had my agent uh, submit them. And they were uh, Saturday Night. The show passed on them. I got a very sweet letter from Ann Beats, who oh. I, I don't know if you know Ann Beats. Uh, uh, she took the time to write a very nice rejection letter. Uh, uh, and uh, then I went on with my life. At that time, it meant uh, working at a video store on 8th Street. <laughs> uh, that was my life, eh, if you call it a life. And, uh, but but uh, unbeknownst- May I interrupt? Uh, yes, what, sir. What was even the Steve, you format? had your hand up? Yes. Uh, 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 this is a six-part question. Uh, <laughs> you know what I love? You know what I love in politics when they when uh, when there's a press conference and a reporter says, "I have a question and a follow-up question." They announce <laughs> right. beforehand that they're not going to be satisfied right. with the answer. They're going to have. They definitely know they have a follow-up. Well, let's just not answer the first one. Go right to the follow-up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, but I'm curious what yeah. what video format uh, around 1980? Because exactly. I don't think VHS had even taken. You're exactly off right. The first the first video stores were at Photomat. By the way, the first video rentals. No one remembers this. But I, I was in one of the very first video rental stores, 1980. What was Photomat? Photomat was where you went to get photos developed before the instant cameras. There used to be these things called daguerreotypes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, videos, the, the video uh, revolution was so new that I was working at a video store. There were only like 12 titles. Nine of them were porn. Uh, <laughs> but the video revolution was so new that uh, we had a woman come in the store, rent a videotape, and then... Take it home and then call us from home and say, now, where in the TV does it go? She really? didn't even know Aww. she needed a machine. That's really? how new it was. Anyway. I hope that wasn't porn. No, it she wasn't. doesn't know where yeah. that goes. I am very <laughs> anxious to see this film, sir. Yeah. I need to have this run yeah. up in the next few minutes. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I'm at the video store. Unbeknownst to me, my agent took the rejected SNL sketches, my four or five sketches uh, that SNL passed, and got them somehow to Mara Marco, who was assembling a, a writing staff for the late, the first late night staff. You know, wow. they, they, uh, Letterman, you might remember, was being sort of kept on hold by NBC. Uh, his morning show had failed, or it had ended, I'm sorry. And uh, he was on hold for a year. They were looking for, to do something with him. And they gave him this slot, and he, they were looking to put it. So I got this call, literally, it's like a bad old Hollywood story from mm-hmm. the, vi- the video store. My uh, my then uh, girlfriend, uh, soon to be wife, soon to be ex wife, <laughs> uh, called and said, uh, "David Letterman's looking for you." Wow! And uh, he's only in town for a day. Wow! And he's up at the Plaza Hotel. Wow! And they're and they they meet you right now if you can get up there. And wow. he's only and he's leaving tomorrow. So I went racing up, uh, and was very excited. But I had I was I think thankfully had no time to prep or get nervous uh-huh. or uh-huh. think about it. I just got on the subway and left and it was one of those, uh, Kevin, watch the register. I got to go. <laughs> I got to go jumpstart my career. And then I, I went uptown and there's Letterman on a couch in a t-shirt and jeans. He uh, was the most casual guy ever, you know, and uh, very, at least when I knew him, very accessible. Steve might have a different, Steve might have Met a different Letterman. He well, was Steve's always, not accessible. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was always in a tux by the night. <laughs> I think. And uh, and I had the guts. I don't know how there was a, there was a coffee table in front of him. He was lying on the couch. There was a coffee table with some spare change on the table. And I don't know where I got the guts, but I came into the suite. And uh, sat down, and there was a spare change, and I actually had the guts to say, uh, "Can I have this?" <laughs> and I collected the change and actually put it in my pocket. <laughs> and uh, and then there might be a lesson did he here. Laugh? Yeah, he did. I, I made him laugh. And there might be a lesson here, and then I'll shut up, and and you can no, go on, are you, you can go on with the real show. But the lesson, Meryl, Meryl uh, described the show that she wanted to do. That she already had it, the vision of it in her mind, and it. I think the DNA didn't really change for 30 years in some ways. I mean, it obviously mutated, but uh, she had the vision of what she wanted to do, including death pieces and then remotes and and the monologue and and the attitude. She Mm -hmm. had it all. She actually, she would actually um, quote certain jokes that she said captured uh, the essence of it. Like, uh, you know, David Letterman's joke, McDonald's is now... Hey, McDonald's is now serving breakfast. Now that's a dream come true. You know that's mm-hmm. a, that's a perfect right. letter. You know that's so she she described the show and my sketches didn't really fit what her sh- the format, but she liked the sketches. But she said, come up with the you know come up with your own ideas and and pitches for 
based on what I just described to you and send them to me. And I, this is a lesson maybe if there are any uh, uh, young writers out there or would-be writers out there. Um, I didn't, I think it's important not to keep them waiting. I don't know if you guys agree. I ran home. I knew they were leaving for LA the next morning and I ran home and pulled an all nighter and, uh, and wrote up three or four pages that night, just based on what, you know, I was all fired up and adrenaline was pumping and I got it at dawn. I got it to back to the Plaza hotel for their flight back to LA. So, so and I, I'm so grateful that that uh, number one, I was able to stay up all night, which I'm no longer. Able to do. <laughs> I'm so grateful to myself that I uh, that I had the uh, the wherewithal to not keep them waiting, and I think that's a, you know if you have a good meeting and and people are waiting on material, it's 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 probably a good a good tip to to get it to them as quick as you can. This is very exciting for me because you two, uh, and I, I don't want to get into Sammy Davis territory. But does anybody have any meth? No, uh, I don't want to get into Sammy Davis territory because... Junior or senior? Uh, junior. Okay. The two of you share senior. a lot of... You share a, a resume, but you also, when you walk into a room, everybody's glad to see you. There's this... Uh, you walk in and... Because Steve because owes them money. Because they know he's got a pocket full of change now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's just when you walk in, when the the comedy, you're just and you're team players and you're looking at, you're thinking about the show. And I love giving hand jobs. Yeah, that's. I didn't want to say that, Steve Young. How did, so? How did you get your first job? What was your first job? Uh, my first TV job was not necessarily the news, right. the HBO show out in Los Angeles, and uh, that was uh, I gotten out of college a couple of years before and knew I wanted to do this as a career, but there was not an immediate success at that. Uh, I did luckily have an agent, some junior level guy at William Morris who had uh, come to the Harvard Lampoon and said, oh, we'd like to find some, uh, some uh, promising young comedy writers. And I said, William Morris? Why is the cigarette company looking for him? <laughs> uh, so I had no idea. But uh, I wrote a Cheers spec script and pr printed it out on my pin feed, early generation Macintosh printer. And I'm, I'm sure it was fine for a 21 year old or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for a while, I was bartending in Boston and just kind of scratching around trying to was figure out. Was there any out. business in Boston f uh, for a bartender? Mm. I can't imagine anybody <laughs> drinking in Boston. Yeah, it's a very teetotalish uh, sort of town. <laughs> Um, so you went to work for not necessarily the news. Yeah. Pat Lee, John Moffat, mm -hmm. Rich Hall, who was on the show he last month, had uh, largely cycled out. This was uh, he, he went to Letterman, probably right. He had uh, been there. Did Rich write on Letterman? He did the morning show. Yeah. He, <clears throat> I I find that uh, often in my career I arrive someplace just as the golden age has <laughs> ended. In the case of not necessarily the news, the generation of performers that everyone knew and loved mostly Conan? had left. Conan had been a writer there like a year before and was gone now, mm -hmm. although I found his cartoons, uh, scraps of paper with his drawings on them in the desk I was using. But uh, Did you keep them? Uh, no, no. Who, who I knew? didn't have, the, didn't yeah. have the foresight. Also, my pockets were very full at the time. Uh, I did find that uh, it, it was a fine place to work, but I was only there six weeks. I had been the sort of last hired, first fired at their first whiff of budget trouble. But uh, I got a couple things on the show and actually got a Writers Guild Award out of that. So Great. that was nice. And then I was in New York working on the Comedy Channel before it was Comedy Central. Right. They were starting up in the fall of 89 and really didn't know what they were doing at that point. It was a lot of let's take old movies from the vault, cut five-minute funny scenes out of them, just show the isolated scenes and have sort of VJs introducing each thing and doing patter and little comedy bits between each thing and so i was on one of those shows for a while and what so tell me how uh, very quickly let's get to how you ended up becoming the legendary i don't want to go ahead how did you get on letterman what happened uh, that was early <laughs> 1990 and uh, the show i think it just had its eighth anniversary and uh, i believe it was <laughs> Out in L.A. and a lot Eight of... Eight years. Yeah, this was uh, 82 to 90 by this point. And a lot of writers went out to L.A. in addition to doing their work at the show that week, 
went on a lot of meetings. And uh, <laughs> in the coming month or so, about five or six of the old line guys said, oh, by the way, we're, we're leaving. <laughs> Is that and, why and, Dave went to L.A.? To get rid of everybody? <laughs> I, I don't know if he's that strategic a thinker about getting rid of writers. I think he has other ways of doing that. But, <laughs> but suddenly there was a, uh, the sense that there were a lot of openings. And the comedy grapevine in New York, which I was tangentially plugged into, was full of people saying, oh, you've got to get your sample in over at Letterman because all the writers are leaving and this is a great time. And Now, why did he require urine? Most people... Um, can you back up? What was that? When in, at, you mean at job interviews? No, no. It's the, the sample that they required was urine. Yeah, it doesn't a, have to be your own. Oh, okay. Go on. Uh, New York in 1990. You could get it on any street corner. <laughs> you could write either 20 monologue jokes or, yeah, vial of urine. Yeah. And the vial, a lot of people overlook that. It has to be a nice vial. Yeah. It has to be glass. You can't come in there with some and, cheap and styrene. They don't, they don't return the vial. No. I, I think they're just in it for the vials. You know, I, I was unusual, I've been told. I got the cap back. <laughs> yeah, here's your cap back. Uh, uh, Reading the tea leaves there. Yeah, Wait, so, but, yeah, but I but think you Steve, but, yeah, Steve, but Steve, I know a little. You, you leapfrogged over The Simpsons just oh, now, didn't the, you? The Simpsons uh, was uh, later. And oh, I was it was only, later. I'm I, sorry. I wrote one episode. It was a oh, freelance thing. Oh, okay. I was never on the staff there. Well, you know, I'm sorry. Being a freelancer on The Simpsons is a, is a, is a huge honor. That's, that's not done a lot. Yeah, and I don't think they do freelance episodes anymore. I think after a couple of years or so, uh, in, when I did it in 96, I think. They didn't do it too much. The Writers point. Guild, for a while, uh, required staffs to hire freelancers. Mm, but this so was before The Simpsons was a guild oh, show. Oh, I didn't. Oh, okay. So it doesn't apply. But okay. luckily, my agent at the time was clever and said, let's get you this Simpsons gig as if it were a guild show. And so you're going to get residuals for your episode. And at the time, wow. none of the other writers were doing that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, a good... I still get an eleven no, dollar the... check once in a while. <laughs> was that the same young William Morris agent that found you er mm, years earlier? I think by that time I, I had moved on, as writers occasionally do. So you get to Letterman. I get to Letterman, and uh, I, I, it was great. I was going to the big leagues from the Comedy Channel up to the big Thirty Rock uh, legendary show, and I got there, and there were a few old line writers left. Steve O'Donnell was the head writer who hired me and was this wonderful talent and a great friend to this day. And uh, you had Randy Cohen and you had Adam Resnick still there and Jerry Mulligan, of course. Wow. And uh, the old timers were wow. shaking their heads sadly by, oh, things are so degraded well, now. Oh, it used to be good in the old days. <laughs> now we sit in this room all evening and think of things that uh, we can't get on the air and uh, it's just so debased compared was to the glory it, was days. Was the top ten list, uh, had that had That, that was a staple. Yeah, yeah, that had been on for a few years by then. So that was a anchor point every day. You knew there'd be that, but uh, just the quest for new ideas that Dave would get behind and actually do, as as was the case from the very beginning. Yeah, it was very always frustrating. A, always a struggle. But uh that was a sort of quiet period, and you felt like, wow, the show is uh, reaching the end of history. And we had 25 years to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that sums up life itself, too, doesn't it? Yes, I have 25 years yes, to exactly. go. Yes, <laughs> exactly. What is it? It, so it you feels did... like the end. It feels like the end, and it doesn't end. It's Steve, like a Samuel Beckett. <laughs> Steve Young, you wrote on Letterman for 25 years? 25 years. Wow. Spring of 90 to the last day, spring of 2015. In the bunker. <laughs> yeah, I, I liked, I mean, there were different up and down periods. Yeah. Some periods I recall less fondly than others, but the last few years at the show, I mean, it was limited what Dave wanted to do. He didn't do remotes anymore. He didn't want to do complicated things that required uh, extensive rehearsal and all that but within those parameters we were still doing things that we all really enjoyed and that would on a good day really tickle Dave because he'd been doing the show for so long he probably had had more comedy come across his uh, radar than almost anyone alive and it was hard to get something that really made his eyelids open up and go whoa this is something we've never thought of before this is, this is a different uh, land that's just opened up and uh, some days you could do that just in a line or a 30-second bit or something and just feel like, okay, 
twenty five years on, no, it's not over. We're still we're still mm -hmm. uh, mining good quality ore here. Andy Breckman, you worked at Thirty Rock. You you I don't mean yeah. I don't want to violate your privacy, but you had like one of those amazing deals with Saturday Night Live where you could just come in. Uh, I I went I was at Saturday Night Live uh, when they were sort of in transition, maybe struggling a little in the early. Let me say, I did Letterman for a couple of years, and then Saturday Night Live. So the mid '80s, I did three years there full time, and then I don't think they do this anymore. Uh, j just as Steve's experience at The Simpsons, they brought me in for the next five or six or seven seasons. I was uh, I was brought in a, uh, as a guest writer, four or five weeks, uh, four or five shows a season. And you kicked because ass. I was, I was, well, I, you know, it's easy as a guest writer because you can make it look easy because you have all year to to think of five. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> the, the challenge is thinking of twenty two ideas every week. Uh, but I had all I had to do was think of five uh, half decent ideas. So I, uh, I, yeah, I always came in with something. But uh, I well, was I, trying to get a movie. What's career interesting, going. yeah, and you did. Uh, what's interesting about the two of you is Steve is. Of the, you know, the regimentation of Harvard, work hard, play hard. Uh, Harvard, play hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Letterman. And Andy, both of you are, come came from it from two different, you entered comedy. You mean I don't work hard? It's you like make it look a lot easier than I do. Well, I, I because would, I don't work hard. But now, did you go to college? I did not go to college. I I came in through a different door. Uh, I I was performing as a as a. I went to BU for a semester, but I <laughs> I wanted to. Uh, and you dropped out of college. I dropped out of college to see if I could make a living performing. I thought I was at the time. I thought I was Randy Newman or. Uh, right, Loudon Wainwright. I don't know if you know sure. that reference, yeah. but doing comedic music and and songwriting, and nobody, none of my so-called friends would tell me I <laughs> <laughs> had the courtesy to tell me I didn't have the talent to do it. So I tried it, and the, the problem was, um, the problem was I didn't fail, I didn't succeed. Obviously, I didn't. You know, I'm not a household name. Obviously, I don't. I didn't succeed, but I didn't fail. I got. I kept getting work. Enough to keep going. The carrot was just dangling, mm -hmm. and uh, and years went by the way years do. And I was uh, I was in my uh, mid twenties, and uh, is this still, where we get to it. have the sex dungeon reference put into the story? <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, yeah, I made a living. Let's just say that. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, you, so I, I I I made I was doing I was doing well enough to keep going, uh, and then thankfully thankfully I stumbled. Backwards into uh, into sketch writing and and uh, and and found uh, before Letterman I had a, another credit on a kids show, uh, but thankfully I realized I could do something else because that's a tough life. Have I ever me. seen you stumped? I, I don't think there's ever been an idea presented to Andy Breckman that I you couldn't that, solve. I, I, I don't I, honestly know what. No, that means. seriously, a movie idea. I've pitched you crazy movie ideas and. Within five minutes. Well, that's my my favorite thing to do is to break stories and uh, and to work on in, in broad strokes work on ideas and that's my favorite thing to do. My least favorite thing, like a lot of writers, is writing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that's hard. Uh, uh, but uh, I do love the I do love the bantering and and the kicking ideas around. And my favorite place to be in the world is a. Is a good writer's room, and right. I don't know if Steve agrees, but uh, I that's... loved the Letterman writer's room. I yeah. felt like this is where I'm becoming the fully realized version of myself. I I definitely agree. It's it's uh, it's my favorite place to be, and I I'm working to get another show going. Not be, not to get a show on the air, really, or to or to write, which is going to be hard. But I just want to get a writer's room right. again. I right. just love being being with the, uh, the Harvard boys. Love them. And uh, my, my favorite words in the English language are when the head writer says, I, I have to shut the door. When, when it's getting so. Because he's going to tell a, a joke. Or that, the room uh, has just gotten. Yeah, we used to get. Okay, close the door. We're going to talk about this in, now, were there, in terms were there, that we don't want the rest of the world to hear. Were right there now. women in the room at Letterman? Intermittently and usually, yes. I mean, that was always, uh, I think, increasingly over the years a project that all these shows have grappled with because uh yeah we we want it to 
be a place that people don't feel excluded from and all that. But it, I mean, did it did it damper some of the the jokes that that you were throwing around? Mm, very little, uh, very little. You're talking about jokes that weren't for the show. Yes, of course. Right. Well, yes, as ninety nine percent of the jokes are the <laughs> the, the shockingly uh, not even that it's graphic or crude, just like the conceptually horrifying. Uh, sometimes was. Was the direction we? Well, in my in my experience, and I think Dave, Dave, you'd agree. In my experience, the fun is being with funny people and 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 poking at it, poking at them, and poking at them until you can get them to laugh. Uh, and that often meant uh, crossing some boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but just getting just getting people you respect to crack up is the was the goal for me. <laughs> like you pretending the, the not getting material on the air, but just making them like and yeah. you know, Andy has this gift of like pretending not to understand the assignment and <laughs> playing <Too>. dumb. The, <laughs> one, the one of the jo most jo you know Brian Reich. I always oh, Brian Rich. I always mispronounce his name. Yep. It's Brian Rich. Yep, very funny, very funny guy. You were probably in college with him. I right? think he was a little younger. And just a frighteningly brilliant guy. He invented the masturbating bear on Conan. Now, yes, but I think it's worth pointing out, bears had been masturbating <laughs> for millennia at, before this Conan business ever happened. But not while what? wearing a diaper. In and life. pimp bot. And I'm sorry? And pimp bot on Conan. Oh, that I'm not as Oh, you never saw pimp bot? It's no. amazing. Anyway, so Brian's like this frighteningly, brilliantly funny guy. And we were traveling somewhere, and Andy and Brian were in the back seat. Okay. And it was dumb and retarded. -er. It was it was the most fascinating conversation for four it's, hours. It's very easy for me to play dumb. But the two of them, just trying in a conversation. Well, he is he is bringing uh, it down. I mean, not dirty. But he's an example. If you can if you can make Brian laugh, that's made my day. That's yeah. that. If you can break him, that's because he's as smart and funny as yeah. uh, as anyone. But just and, you uh, guys, I, I can't articulate it, but. They, they would start a conversation that would go on for an hour, and the premise was, would be wrong. It would be based on some wrong fact, mm -hmm. and then they would pursue it down. It, it was, it was, it was, anyway, um, yeah. Betsy Bournes has a, is a great comedy writer and writes about comedy, and she has a new podcast. Going back to women, the first writing job I had was on Roseanne, and she hired women. And my recollection of the female writers on Roseanne were they were as filthy, if not filthier, than the guys. I mean, they would, I, I don't want to mention any names, but there were female writers who were doing Lucy and Ethel, you know, with the candy, mm -hmm. pretending to be blowing guys, you know. So I, the idea that women can't be as horrible in a room as a guy is... No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, belief holds any water, but I do think that there are cultural influences that begin when you're a child, and if you're a girl, you may be influenced and socialized to think you're supposed to be the quieter one, and oh, boys right. are right. the boisterous, noisy, attention-getting ones, and then this is hard to uh, overcome later if you think, well, I'm a funny person, but I'm not used to thinking that I'm the, the one who's going to get up and get the attention and maybe writing is a little different than performing in that, but I will tell you that in the later years of Letterman, I was looking at the writing submissions coming in, and even after we told agents, we are always very interested in seeing uh, promising uh, women writers. We, we, we don't want you to hold back on this. It was 25 to 1 men to women submitting to the Letterman show, and maybe by that point we weren't the hottest show. Maybe there were other shows that uh, the most talented women thought this is where I'm aiming mm -hmm. for so maybe that's not a real sample but that has always stuck out to me as an example of the underlying uh, social cultural blah 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 hyphenated uh, th things that are going on what I would do if I had a particularly raunchy joke in a room uh, and there was a woman in the room is I would spell it <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that women can spell what they can spell <laughs> Holy, <laughs> holy, 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 there's a, 
there's a there's a real flaw in my plan. <laughs> Happiest day it's ever. It's an F-L-A-W in my plan. <laughs> well, first of all, I, again, as with the bear, I'm going to point out, not all women can spell, so you may have been fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. We're looking for very funny, very illiterate women. Yeah. The women went out and created Broad City and Amy Schumer and Sarah, you know, right? And girls and all that kind yeah. of stuff. They, yeah. they, they probably... Well, they probably had a male producer <laughs> helping. To help yeah, them with the spelling. Them. Yeah, the spelling, yeah. <laughs> I think if I were a woman... I Those would shows look. are so good, you've got to believe. <laughs> it's funny that the Letterman show was... Cr Dave will say this, was created by, you know, Meryl Marco. Yeah. Pretty and much created the format. Many of his long-term... Uh, uh, producers were, yes. were women, and, and yeah. there were very talented women coming in and out over right. the years. There is a. I did. I was doing somebody's radio show the other day, and there were. It was me, the host, and three other women, and then Rich Voss came in, the great comedian Rich Voss, and the male energy took over, and I, we were all three of us have daughters, and you know we look over and we see the women. And there is a male energy that is... Trying to impress them? Well, and it dominates. It's not necessarily more powerful. It's just louder. There is, and there's a female energy. There, is, there are two different this energies. This confirms my theory that men want to get laid. <laughs> I've been saying that for years. <laughs> and you've just confirmed it. So that we were men showing... Men are anxious to impress women. Yeah, it's well. Look, I can't sink a three-point basket. I, I can't hit a <laughs> curveball. This is all I can do to, to, to you know, to get women to. Have what you ever, about your comedy songs? <laughs> <laughs> believe me, that doesn't work either. You've got to believe me. I I tested that for ten years. Have you ever laughed a woman into bed? Um, well, I. Uh, I don't have an option. I don't know what else. I, <laughs> what else do I have? Go. How does a comedy me? writer? Except now I could go up to a woman, you know, and say I, I make a very handsome living. As a comedy writer, what do you do? You you meet a woman, you hand some jokes to a funny guy. I, I don't, he now, reads do you guys agree? Do you guys agree that I don't? Are you? I know you're single now. I don't know if you're dating. I don't know what Steve's situation is. But a woman who laughs is a gift from God. You know, just a, a real laugher, and I love. Uh, you know, both my, I've been married twice and both my wives uh, were very generous with their laughter. And that's, that's just the, the juice. That's the energy that keeps me going every day. But is that, I wouldn't know what to do with a tough room at home. <laughs> 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 that would be hell on earth. Tell what your daughter this used to do. This is a to tough say. room just sitting at the kitchen table. Tell what your daughter used to do. Oh yes. I, uh, my daughter, uh, at the, kid, at, the, at the dinner table, if dad, if I told a joke or tried to be funny and it, it didn't work, it, if the joke wasn't funny, uh, my daughter Rachel would start crying, playfully crying and saying, we're going to starve. <laughs> <laughs> that, was her, that was her thing. Around the house. Mm, I'm not going to ask yes. you personal questions, but let's just say, Steve Young, you, you've had children. That's right. I live in a dwelling. <laughs> What's it like? <laughs> Is it wonderful? <laughs> it's not bad. I mean, it keeps you out of the elements. I haven't met your kids. Andy Breckman's kids yeah. were raised, are being raised, exactly how my kids were raised. No, actually, well, better because... Well, I don't know better, but... They are constantly pitching. You go over, you well, walk into the house... There are two beautiful kids. These are the from the the new oh, yeah, marriage from Beth. Well, it's funny you say that. As we're sitting here in New York and in, in, on the Lower East Side, my son Evan, my ten year old son, who I have a feud with, who you're having a yeah, celebrity feud <laughs> with my ten year old son. Uh, good luck on that feud, by the way. Uh, he wouldn't do a roast battle yeah, with me. Um, I wanted is, to do a roast battle. I have with to pick him up. I have to leave in a few minutes to pick him up. He's at comedy school uh, class. Really, he's doing stand up comedy on uh, at the Gotham Comedy Club. Oh. He comes out and does like every every at the end of every semester they come out and do <laughs> five minutes and you got to come to see it. Oh I'll my god! You know. I... uh, but his last comedy routine was uh, he came out and said, you know, every comedian <laughs> needs a hook, needs a gimmick. I'm the comic without a phone. <laughs> <laughs> and he did a whole five minutes on how he doesn't have a phone. Uh, 
Very funny kid. And but he doesn't would... have a phone because you're he's... not funny and you're starving? Because <laughs> yeah, he's 10. I don't know. When did your kids get phones? He's 10. So wait a second. Don't you think this would have been fun? There was a bet of Andy, by the way, hosts for WFMU. I have a show not unlike uh, this. And Steve Young should come on your show. He'd be, he he's always the, welcome. He has the most amazing show. You would have so much fun. I would go with you just to watch you... Go be on his show. Well, Steve was telling us about his dwelling. No, You're, I want to. I want to hang on for one second. Ah, so, all right, they were doing a benefit for WFMU, which is the greatest radio station. I'm familiar with it. I know Irwin Chusid. Yes, he's my like lead-in actually oh, okay. on Wednesdays. And there are two great radio stations in America: KPFK in Los Angeles, where my radio show is, and WFMU. Beautiful, and it's just a beautiful building. So they were doing a benefit at Monty Hall. <laughs> That's the name of it. Oh, them. yes. I, I've been there. I've done a show in there. Oh, great. Oh, yes. By the way, I, I did your in, show. In Jersey City, That's it's now become a real hot venue. Yeah, you can get over there on the PATH train. Right? Yes. Yeah, the fun. number of people who heard me on your show. Uh, okay, well. So anyway, they're doing a benefit for WFMU. And I it was a talent show. And I said, why don't. Evan, your 10-year-old son, and I do a roast battle. He doesn't know you. <laughs> and I, it'd be fun, and I, I would kick his ass. That's just wrong. That's no, it isn't. So it's much. hysterical. All right. Well, let me ask Steve Young. Okay. Let me ask Judge Young. <laughs> I'm going to have to thread this needle very carefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The yeah. idea would be a roast battle. Right. And I, and they introduce me as, as a guy who's written on roasts. He's written for Triumph the Insult Comic Dog. And he's going to go up against... Evan, this ten-year-old, and the pre you know everybody automatically assumes that Evan is going to kick my well, ass. Well, but he doesn't. The point, the problem is he doesn't. David, God bless you, I love you, but he doesn't know you very well. You're not. I mean, you've been to the house a few times, but you're. I mean, to say to Evan, you're going to go on stage, and this man, <laughs> this middle-aged man, is going to ridicule you. <laughs> it's just a tough sell to a ten-year-old. <laughs> But no, but for the funny. Would. But for the funny. Okay, maybe. But he doesn't know you. He, all right. What did he, he say? He doesn't did you, love you. Most. I don't even. I, I didn't even. I don't know. You didn't pitch it used it? to be that right. your average 10 year old knew all the Feldman references. Now I don't know <laughs> don't if they know. do. I don't. Just, yeah. It's getting tougher and tougher to get him into your van, isn't it, Dave? <laughs> I don't know. I just, yeah. I just comedy fan. Hey kids, come in the van and we'll work on a routine. <laughs> I wanted to do a double with my son. They call them doubles, <laughs> and back in vaudeville, and I and I wanted to come out there and humiliate my son. <laughs> and we used to do it at parties. When we, it would be so much fun to have a father son yeah. comedy team. I I don't know. Has it ever? Has there? Is it unprecedented? Yes. Father-son comedy team? Yeah, and we would do I it. mean, you've seen bro siblings, of course. We would do it when we had parties. My son and I would come out, yeah. and I would, you know, the comedy team, I don't want to mention the name, but and I'd come out, and everybody would automatically assume that he was going to make fun of me, and i just humiliate him. I would That's pretend to read his report card and just tell him what I caught, tell people what I caught him doing. What I would do is I'd have Evan come out, and every time I moved, he would flinch. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's, like he's scared of me. <laughs> They uh, will. I will. Well, well, I will sit. He, he, I, once a year, they deign to invite me to their beautiful. You're always home. invited. And the the kids, when I walk in, they immediately start pitching me show ideas, jokes, and it's. it's You're like, all very show busy people. This, this they don't think uh, I this can stuff tell doesn't anyone. happen at my house. <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, the kids are your kids. Uh, did have, have your kids gone into show business? No, uh, I have a, well, that's a badge of honor. For my you. older daughter is about to go to grad school to get a, a master's in social work, <laughs> a fine, Spring healthy seltzer. sense of humor, uh, but uh, not seeming to be inclined towards that. She's getting world. in what uh, social work, she wants to get a oh, wow. become a clinical therapist. Wow, uh, a, certainly a very healthy and robust sense of humor, and right. but doesn't seem to think that she needs to be creating it, so that's right. fine. The younger daughter is in college now, and I don't know what she'll end up towards. She also is a very funny person, but she doesn't seem like she has a, a, a great drive to be brought into the world. <laughs> well, that means that, that means you raise them well. That means they're happy. That means they're well-adjusted and they don't have that void in their life. One of my favorite quotes in the, in, in, in the world is, um, happy people do not make history. Mm -hmm. You know, Wow. History is being made by by people that are driven. But I'm curious, uh, and maybe before you go, if you could comment on this, there's this 
perception, maybe we even talked about this last time I was here, that comedy writers have to be bitter and neurotic in order to have this comedy engine fired up to deal with their issues through comedy. And I always felt growing up that I'm not really that way. I just like really weird, silly, funny, smart stuff. And I'm, I think, fairly well adjusted most of the time. I don't know. I don't know where it starts. I don't know. Like I look at, I have five kids. I have three from a previous uh, administration, as I say, and, <laughs> and then two from two from back. And and four of the four of the five are not interested at all in show business or entertaining people or getting on stage. But my fifth, at my youngest, Evan, uh, it is important to him. It's how he looks at the world, yeah. and he filters wow. everything through comedy. And so, so I, have, I don't know if it's genetic. I, I mean, I don't know if I raised him differently. So uh, if I have another half dozen kids, I might get one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if you want one, uh, but I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if he's the lucky one or the unlucky one. Yeah. But but that's that's you know he's his identity is kind of built around being funny, and he loves making kids in the class laugh. And he will he will come home sometimes from school and say, "I got off a great zinger, <laughs> got off a great zinger today," and and that's that's who he is, just like you and I do. Is he at got the point of trying to impress girls with? This? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's who he is. I mean, that's and that's who we are. That's it's, do you give note? I got into trouble. I would note my kids. Oh, you there. would re do a little polish. I did. It was like I would correct them. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, it was like it was math. But was that can be fine if they see that you're. Not trying to diminish them, but mm -hmm. actually trying to help them. Have you done that? Have well, you... no, no one brings me comedy. To... No, I'm talking about during, in a conversation with my kids. I've never tried to help your kids with comedy. <laughs> they will make a joke, mm -hmm. and I will, and when will... they were younger, and I would correct their witticisms. And they actually didn't complain, to their credit. No. Sometimes, there were so many more horrible things that I was doing. Sometimes around the dinner table, somebody will... Uh, try a humorous remark and and I'll say or this and I'll have the yeah. ho hopefully slightly mm -hmm. punchier version they all, all go oh of course well there you go <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's I, all right. I think I know how they feel you're, you're funnier than me right here when your kids make you laugh that's the greatest it's the greatest it's the greatest no, but, our, but is it intentional? Because I've found that most of the, <laughs> most of the mo hilarious stuff I think that has ever happened in human history has been done by little kids who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> but I think they try to make you laugh. And then if I really laugh and it's a genuine moment, it's not unlike I think maybe you and I shared. If you can get Letterman to crack up, mm -hmm. you know, if you can make that Letterman laugh, that was something you you savored that uh, those moments. And they didn't happen every day, at least not for me. But. And it's probably the same for kids making their, their dad laugh. I'm always amazed when my kids can do things comedically that I can't do, like get a laugh. <laughs> like, I can't do sarcasm. Both of you guys, well, you, you're you not sarcastic. Steve Young, obviously. I think it's in there somewhere. I have yeah. this, uh, and maybe this is a little different than the male comedy paradigm of being super loud and energetic. I usually find that I do well with the calm, deadpan, mm -hmm. just slip the shiv into your rib cage sort of thing. I've never been able That's I, not in my DNA. It's not in my DNA either. I can't yeah. do it. I remember when we moved into our house, I, one of my daughters, 10 years old, we had gotten sconces. And I never thought... Oh my God, he's finally telling the sconce story. <laughs> I've been asking for this for I don't know how long. <laughs> That's basically what my daughter said. That's exactly. Uh, we were, my wife and I was like nine in the morning. We were both leaving for work, and we couldn't believe we had a living room with go. with sconces and go. Oh no no no! I want to hear the end no, of the sconce story. No, it's a No no no! I'm so sorry. That was so. You have to go. I do. I have tickets for Guardians of the Galaxy, and I have to get back to New Jersey. Okay. Will Evan come in here? You should have the you should have the children of your guest uh, <laughs> as a funny. sort of a little I, group. Have you, you done that on your should. show? No, it's a great idea. The children of your of the funniest friends you have bring their kids in and just treat them like adults. Well, you'd get great stories. It, it certainly would be uninhibited. Well, it'd be, it would be fun to do the show with kids. No. Yes. 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 Yeah, but it's a tough. Okay, I'll have to drive Evan down here to do it. It's a tough neighborhood. Would Evan do... Would you just, know what I saw up front? Just call him on his phone. So, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you, Andy. Oh, hey, no, thanks very much, Steve. Good to see you again. We're well, going to be uh, right back. Say. Andy Breckman, how do people reach you? How do they listen to the... Dear God, how do they reach you? WFMU. Oh, oh, they, they can... Uh, WFMU on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evenings. Okay. Yeah. And it's a great show. Well, that means a lot. Hey, and it meant a lot to be asked okay. here. Steve, Thank God you. bless you and your work. Okay. We'll I'm be sorry, right back. Okay. Talk about me first. Talk about me first.